All right. All right. Uh, good morning, evening, afternoon. This is Masa Jati. Got a very special guest, Evan Alexander, uh, who ha who's had his own near-death experience, and we'll get into that in just a second. But again, I'm so excited. So we'll just jump in like we always do. Now, Evan Alexander, he's a, he's a doctor. He was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at the, uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. In 2008, uh, he experienced a transcendental near-death experience uh, during a week-long coma from an inexplicable brain infection that completely transformed his worldview, pioneering scientist and modern thought leader in the emerging science that acknowledges that primacy of consciousness in the universe. He is the author of the New, New York Times number one bestseller, Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. Evan, uh, welcome. Well, Moss, it's great to be here with you today. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm so excited because, uh, you know, a, as a fellow ND ear, um, so, so, um, again, there's there's been a lot of people who've had NDEs and so on like that, but I think there's a few people that really stand out, and you know, obviously, you're one of them. So, um, I think this conversation is going to be really intriguing for for our audiences, you know, because we can get into the deeper facts on how all that stuff works. So, uh, for for people who don't know you, for people who are new to you, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us about the uh, your uh, near death experience? Okay, well, I think of several important things to point out. Uh, at the time I had this in, in uh, 2008, mm -hmm. uh, I was 54 years old, and I spent those years that you talked about at Harvard Medical School, thought I understood something about brain, mind, and consciousness. Uh, right. But I must confess, I was basically a kind of conventional in my thinking uh, to the mm -hmm. point where, you know, I thought, yeah, I guess the brain does create consciousness, and I guess our existence is birth to death and nothing more. Now, there have been times in my life earlier when I right. wanted to believe much more than that. Right. Uh, my father, for example, was a very accomplished academic neurosurgeon, very respected globally, okay. uh, and uh, he had a strong faith in God and in mm -hmm. knew a power of prayer, um, and, and he was very scientific. Uh, there was never a conflict for him, but like many of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s, I knew science was the pathway to truth, but also, like many of us, I made the mistake of thinking materialist science, you know, Newtonian determinism mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, the, the, the science of the day and didn't realize how crucial quantum physics was in demonstrating to us the primacy of consciousness in the universe. So anyway, that's kind of the setting for the, uh, for the weak in coma. Um, and uh, another important thing to point out is mm -hmm. that uh, my entire experience has an atypical feature in the form of amnesia, that I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life during my coma. And you, you knowing a lot about NDEs will recognize that as an unusual feature. Most people uh, seem to have a pretty good notion of their lives. And when I first came back from mm -hmm. all this, not being familiar with the NDE literature, and also having had my memories deleted in this uh, mm -hmm. extreme amnesia due to meningitis, my early thinking, uh, I, I tended to default to my prior neurosurgical beliefs and think, well, my doctors have told me that my brain was horribly infected. The entire neocortex was mm -hmm. involved. Maybe that explains why all those memories disappeared. But that, that kind of uh, recognition was made at a time uh, before all my memories started uh, coming back. I mean, everything came back over about two months. That was okay. the surprise. We talk about a lot of that in the third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, how memories are not even stored in the brain. But uh, that's kind of one of the final that's, nails. That's what I was, gonna ask you. I was yeah. gonna actually ask you that. Do you think memories are stored in the brain? Well, or they're not, and, and we'll talk about else. So I'd love to talk, talk to you about that. Yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit, but let me just Perfect. get into the story and uh, what happened to me. And important to point out, not only are the medical details that I uh, uh, presented in Proof of Heaven, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, but also people have access to a medical case report written by three doctors who were not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. That case report came out in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September 2018. And it's important to mention because they went beyond where I went in proof of heaven in terms of making two very powerful conclusions 
One was that my brain was far too incapacitated based mm -hmm. on the uh, neurologic exam, CT and MRI scans, lab values, uh, et cetera, to have had any dream or hallucination, much less the most profound experience of my life. That was really kind of the origin of my um, wanting to write up the book Proof of Heaven and put it out to the world was because I knew that something that extraordinary had happened. But at least this case report confirms that, validates it very strongly, that my brain couldn't have had this experience according to the tenets of modern neuroscience. Right. And that's very important. The second major point of that case report, they were challenged by the peer reviewers who said, uh, this case is absurd. No one ever has you know, been this sick with bacterial meningoencephalitis coma for a week, and then ended up making a full recovery after being that deep in coma. How mm -hmm. do you explain it? And the doctors who wrote the case report said, it's because he had a near death experience. So the scientific peer reviewer said, okay, now we have an explanation. And they knew of other cases of uh, NDEs associated with profound healing. So I just want to clarify all that up front. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not just some little NDE story, but it's one that occurred right. in a brain that was well monitored and that that brain could not have mustered such an experience based on everything we understand about neuroscience. Uh, but especially right. the healing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that part is the real shocker. And you've really got to explain that if you're trying to explain any of this. How did I have such a miraculous healing? So diving deep into the experience itself, it all began in what I call the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive course, kind of unresponsive realm, like being in dirty jello. And in the yeah. setting of this amnesia, it might sound foreboding and, and uh, frightening, but it was the only thing I'd ever known. So mm -hmm. I was fine. I, I just adapted to what the universe was showing me through this whole experience. Um, and and uh, how it unfolded was starting in that uh, earth where my view, a uh, very kind of primitive course and very unresponsive realm, but I was rescued by a slowly spinning white light that came packaged with a perfect musical melody. Mm -hmm. And that light That's interesting. served as a portal going okay. up to the ultra real gateway valley. Uh, and that was really, uh, that's the... Uh, where our, we would reunite with higher souls, soul groups, uh, go through life reviews, plan next incarnations, all of that kind of thing would happen in that, uh, uh, in that gateway valley kind of realm. It's a, a realm where you're completely outside of space and time. Uh, I mean, the very fact that people even describe life reviews gives you a clue of that. Right. Uh, and also other features <clears throat> of the life review, uh, like, for example, how people often describe that it's more real than lived events. Uh, mm -hmm. how they describe that it's like uh, going through the events of one's life, but from the perspective of others around them who are affected uh, by their thoughts and actions. So your life review is not your little personal view of it all, but actually the kind of global view of how the rest of the world uh, felt about your interactions with it. Uh, so that's the kind of realm we're talking about, where birth to death, everything in between can be relived, not just remembered. Uh, so it's a very extraordinary realm outside of space and time. And for yes. me, what this experience involved was I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. There were millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling in vast formations mm -hmm. above this valley that was very lush. It was, I, I liken the whole situation to, it's kind of like Plato's world of ideals, because this world that I was witnessing was in many ways, a world of perfection. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, all the souls down below, the, the people dancing in this valley, thousands of them, I remember them, uh, just incredible festivities and joy and mirth and children playing, dogs jumping. I mean, this incredibly beautiful scene. It's very difficult to uh, convey uh, with words alone. Um, and the best part about it all was I wasn't witnessing alone this alone. There was a beautiful woman beside me on the butterfly wing with sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, high forehead, broad smile. She never said a word to me. She never mm -hmm. had to. But her emotional truth and message was delivered telepathically, emotionally to me. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply cared for. And I cannot tell you how reassuring and comforting that was at that time, because up until that moment, you know, none of this seemed to make sense, but I was beginning right. to realize this felt like a true spiritual home. As mm -hmm. much as the words I may use may sound foreign to people, the important thing to stress is it was so comforting to be in right. this beautiful realm 
with all the joy and merriment and uh, incredible scenery below, earthly scenery, and yet those angelic choirs above that were emanating chants and anthems and hymns that would just thunder through me and would power this, this whole scene below in the meadow and in the forest below. Uh, those angelic choirs were going to provide yet another portal. Now, before all that happened, mm -hmm. wait, I, wait, I have to stop you here. Okay. Because everybody's going to ask, who was the woman? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I don't want to have to uh, issue a spoiler alert here. Okay. The woman was very important. And uh, okay. um, it turns out that a, a huge part of my story that is uh, mm -hmm. a big part of what I reported in, in Proof of Heaven and in many of my uh, sharings of this Mm -hmm. involves the fact that I was adopted. My birth mother was uh, 16 years old, unwed, uh, back in 1953. And uh, in uh, fact, at age 11 days, I went on a hunger strike. I think it's because I perceived some of the energy in the home that was not so welcoming. And I was hospitalized, taken by social services. But my birth mother it took uh, her four months to sign the papers to give uh, me up for adoption. So the, the point there is that I spent four months in a baby dorm mm -hmm. without a caring... Uh, you know, devoted parent. Of okay. um, and in, in essence, uh, much of my life, even though that led to some subliminal messaging mm -hmm. about my worthiness of living, I wasn't aware at a conscious level, but subconsciously, there was always this doubt of whether I was worthy of love. And that is an important thing to get if you want to fully understand my soul journey and this near-death experience. Yeah. Because yeah. I came to a positive, affirmative answer to that question, but only after also going through a dark night of the soul, as mm -hmm. I explain in the book Proof of Heaven, because in the year 2000, my mm -hmm. older son, Evan IV, he was in sixth grade in school at the time, and he uh, had a school project where they needed more information on our biological heritage. And he told me, Dad, you've got to reach out to, to your birth mother again and try and get more information. So I wrote another letter to the children's home, just like I had done back in my uh, teens and early 20s. I mm -hmm. always had gotten the same answer. She's not looking for you, so forget about it. Um, wow. But anyway, that's not the answer I got this time. In the year 2000, when I sent that letter off or made that request, I heard back from the social worker. Uh, and again, this is all in, there in proof of heaven. We were, mm -hmm. I was driving through a blizzard to take my older son skiing up in Maine. Uh, and I remembered it was Friday afternoon. Oh, yes, call the social worker. She might have some news. So I called her up and she said, I do have news. Are you sitting down? Well, I was driving through a blizzard. I was sitting down. So I said, yes. She said, your birth parents got married. I cannot tell you what a shocker that was. I never in my whole life envisioned that they got married. She said, there's more. Uh, they had three children, but your youngest sister died two years ago. That would have been 1998. Uh, and it's because they're still grieving her loss. It's not a good time to come back in their lives. And that was a false interpretation by the social worker. She had very limited right. data, but it, that perceived rejection from my birth family sent me into a dark night of the soul. I stopped mm. saying prayers of my son, stopped taking him to church. I stopped saying prayers at night. I mean, I just gave up on any hope in a loving personal God. And that's the way it was for eight years. Now, of note, a year before my coma, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. sister said, don't you think it's time you reached out to your birth family again? And uh, my first response was no, because I remember how that kicked me over the deep end back in 2000. But they were right. They could sense there was a hole within me that I right. at, least, at least, least needed to try to fill by reaching out once one more time. And so I wrote another letter, this time a positive response. Uh, oh, nice. October 5th, 2007, I walked down a, a sidewalk in Chapel Hill and for a uh, big red door opened on a house. And for the first time in 54 years, I hugged my mother. Uh, a few wow. minutes later, I hugged my father. And that weekend, I met my birth sister and brother who was still living. And so the rest of it, a beautiful, powerful story of reunion. But very importantly, uh, of course, they were still grieving the loss of that beautiful sister, even at that time, mm -hmm. uh, much uh, numb by the loss. Um, and that is what you're alluding to, is that actually becomes an important part of the story at the end of Proof of Heaven. And I won't completely tell it all because uh, yeah. there's so much richness there for people to enjoy the story. But I think people can surmise a bit about where this is headed. Uh, and yes, that uh, recognition four months after my coma 
with a picture sent in the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my heart still pounds and it sends shivers up my spine to even remember that moment of recognition. But wow, that was when it all came together. And I realized it all seemed way too real to be real because it really occurred. I had uh, tried to fight that a bit for the last mm -hmm. months, trying to, you know, my doctors had told me it was had to be a vast hallucination, even though they couldn't understand how I was healing. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's kind of the, the, the story behind all that. But I, I should probably finish off a few details about the NDE itself, and then we can dive into deeper discussion, if that's okay with you. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, well, one of the things I was asked is like, how did you heal? Um, um, uh, you know, I, I read little bits and pieces. I don't know if you want to share about that. Uh, the, the touching part about, was about your son. Uh, uh, well, there, there, yeah. Well, let, let me tell a little more of the story then. And okay. we, we can get into that. So we've, we've left in this beautiful valley, this uh, valley with mm -hmm. earth-like features, but very rich spiritual uh, kind of presence to it and kind of outside of time where one's entire life can be presented in multiple lifetimes. Uh, but in that environment, mm -hmm. um, what happened was the angelic choirs of these swooping orbs above that were fueling these incredible festivities going on in this gateway valley, they provided yet another portal up to higher and higher levels. And I remember seeing all of four-dimensional space-time collapsing down, all of those deeper uh, levels, deep time and or meta time, the, the realm, mm -hmm. spiritual realm, where your entire lifetime can be simultaneously presented, all yes. of that collapsing down. Uh, and, and, and all of that was then what I call an oversphere. And I was in the region that I call the core. The core was a complete resolution of all dualities, all paradoxes, everything coming into oneness. It's where I recognize that our very source of conscious awareness is that uh, divine God force, that infinitely loving power that so many indie ears have experienced on these deep journeys. And I came to recognize that that was the very uh, kind of source of our, of our conscious awareness, that we're never separate from that uh, infinitely loving God force uh, in, in our lives. And that, of course, was very refreshing. Uh, in the core realm, uh, always told you're not here to stay, you'll be going back, but we'll teach you many things. Now, not in, in words, those are the words I put down weeks later, but in pure mm -hmm. conceptual flow, that was kind of the message. Um, and there were many visions I had at multiple levels through this. Uh, it turns out that I would also cycle through these realms. In other words, I would tumble back down from that sanctum sanctorum of the divine, the core, that mm -hmm. infinite inky blackness that was filled to overflowing with the love of the divine, I would fall from that all the way back down to that earth where my view. But I learned quickly that by remembering the musical notes of the melody, that's how I could conjure up that light portal that would take me back up into the gateway valley, always welcomed by the guardian angel, the same a beautiful message to me. Uh, each time I pass through there, the same kind of witnessing of this, uh, these festivities, this kind of junction point, but then on to the core. Uh, and there were several lessons in particular that were crucial for my understanding of things like life reviews and reincarnation, because um, uh, those were, you know, the certainly the reincarnation was never anything that I thought was uh, possible, for my religious upbringing. Uh, right. And yet it was crystal clear to me in these passages that our souls come back again and again to get this right. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so do you think that that reality that you're in was, 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 well, is more real than this reality? It was much more real. It was much more memorable, more detailed, more yep. meaningful and powerful. And an interesting thing is as the entire journey went on and I went to the core realm and I cycled through these realms, and then finally I was uh, uh, blocked from entering that gateway valley. Uh, mm -hmm. and just as they would promised me in the core, you're not here to stay. There came a time when I could no longer conjure up through the memory of the musical notes, that passageway right. up into the gateway valley. To say right. I was sad at that point would be uh, an <laughs> understatement, but uh, I also I know. knew I could trust. And that's, the, that's really the critical ingredient. I could trust in the universe, that loving God force, that beautiful uh, guardian angel that I would be taken care of. And that's what I ended up witnessing. And my next vision was really of thousands of beings going off in the distance around me, heads bowed, some holding candles. This murmuring energy coming from them was just as comforting. It's just as yeah. much 
you were in your spiritual home as I'd originally felt in the Gateway Valley in the core. But now I'm feeling it down in this lowest realm, and it's coming from all these beings around me. And that's what was guiding me back. And what I called all that in my writings weeks later was the power of prayer, that that's what I was sensing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what was kind of guiding me back uh, to this world. Uh, and then I saw the six faces that bubble up out of the muck. They would say a few words that I didn't understand because of my amnesia, which still mm -hmm. applied to our language. Um, and then they disappear. But th those faces were important because they were five of them were people who were physically present in the ICU room. The last 24 hours I was in coma. Wow. So they helped me, they served as what are called veridical time anchors to show that most of the coma experience had to happen between days one and four or one and five of the seven day coma. And it was really the, the last of those faces that I saw that uh, ended up kind of bringing me back to this world. That was a 10 year old boy. And I didn't recognize him when I saw it, but it was my son Bond. That was mm. Sunday morning, day seven of coma. Uh, and they'd kept wow. on the worst news. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, wow. Okay. <laughs> they, they, I'm almost done with this part. And then we yeah, can no worries. all I your love questions. It. I love the story. Um, so, but anyway, uh, it turns out Bond had overheard a conversation with the, the doctors talking with my family saying I've gone from 10% chance of survival down to 2% with no chance of recovery. And that's when he knew, uh-oh, things are much worse than they've told me. He came running down the hallway into ICU uh, bed 10, where I'd been lying for seven days, on the ventilator with my eyes taped shut, he pulled open my eyelids. One eye looking over there, one over there, neither pupil working. Anybody in medicine knows that's a horrible picture. Uh, and he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Wow. Now, I didn't understand the words. And I promise you, I didn't see him with my eyes or hear him with my ears. I was far too gone from this body and this material world. But the message got through. And up mm. until this time, because of my amnesia, and all, I thought, well, this can continue. It can cease. None of it matters. But now everything mattered because I realized mm. there was another soul out there that had this deep pleading need for me to be present for them in some fashion. And so mm -hmm. it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It was like crawling out of a, a gravel pit where you're buried up to your ears. And every time you mm -hmm. reach up, everything collapses around you. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And yet I had to come back. I was compelled to come back for, for him. And I, you know, I had no idea how it happened. My higher soul engineered the pathway back. But when I did come back to this world, my mm -hmm. brain was still so wrecked by the meningitis that I didn't even recognize loved ones at the bedside, my mother, my sisters, my sons. I had no idea who these beings were, but I did remember deeply everything that had happened during the coma experience. And in the next 36 hours, I was in and out of a paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare. I remember that somewhat, but those memories faded quickly over a few weeks, very mm -hmm. different from the deep spiritual memories of the NDE, which are as sharp and vivid today as if the whole thing happened yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a tremendous difference in the memories. And of course, then as I'm recovering from all this, my amnesia for past life events is still very active, but it like a gently falling snow, my memories are returning. And in fact, within two months, after all my semantic uh, neurosurgical, neuroscience, cosmology knowledge, every bit of that came back. Mm -hmm. I recognize based on detailed conversations with close family and friends about early life events that some of my memories were much more complete now than they had been before coma. And that's yeah. something we get into great detail in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, which is really the proof of heaven. Proof of heaven as a book was a, more of a question mark. Uh, the second book, Map of Heaven, really showed how these are common experiences that happen to millions of people. But the, the real continuation of my story was Living in a Mindful Universe, a book that was co-written with my life partner, Karen Newell, who I've been mm -hmm. with for 11 years now. She's the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics, which is the program that I use for a binaural beat brainwave entrainment meditation on a regular mm -hmm. basis to return to my NDE, to uh, you know cultivate and develop relationships with the various guides and angels of my NDE. All that's accomplished through meditation. And the, I think the real message for people in, in this world is you don't have to have an NDE to get all of this. If you That's develop so a you know, meditation, centering prayer, start a practice of going within consciousness, you'll realize mm -hmm. uh, just how vast and profound that deep mystery of consciousness is. And that uh, as you especially begin to leave your little ego voice 
uh, you know, in the rearview mirror and start yeah. examining uh, your conscious awareness writ large in meditation or centering prayer, you start finding uh, that this universe is far grander than anything we ever thought, uh, you know, back when we worshiped little materialist thoughts of birth to death and nothing more. Uh, there's yeah. so much more to our existence. And that, uh, I think, is a tremendous gift that comes out of all this, and especially that you don't have to have an NDE to get all this and know what I know. Just start working on a program of meditation and learning more and more about NDEs and about this entire literature, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll realize that we are uh, you know, advanced spiritual beings that have a lot more power in our lives than we normally think, especially if we believe uh, the materialist falsehood <clears throat> Uh, that our culture preaches absolutely i totally agree with you uh in, in fact i i teach a lot of the stuff that you talk about in detail i see the uh -huh. science on that so which is really really cool uh so we'd have to talk uh so, sometime uh, about that yes uh, but some of the things that i want to bring out was uh, the faces that you saw uh i know you weren't uh you know conscious of those faces but could you have been communicating uh with say your son's higher self like his spirit you know what no, most people would call um rather than yeah sure he was here physically but there's so many layers of consciousness that you communicate at so he was there physically by your bedside and so on but were you connecting do you think at a much higher level well uh, i know the like connection level I know the connections were at a very high level because one of the faces I saw, and mm -hmm. I talk about all this in Proof of Heaven, was not physically there in the room with us. It was Susan okay. Wrenches. Turns out I first met Susan in our freshman mm -hmm. English class at UNC Chapel Hill in 1970. Oh, wow. uh, and then we lost touch with each other, but then we reconnected uh, mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. My former spouse was co-teaching with Susan Wrenches at a high school in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, lost touch again. But when I went to coma, my uh, family remembered that Susan had done work channeling to people, you know, with various illnesses, including coma. Okay. And a book called Third Eye Open about all of her. But anyway, my family called her up uh, to see if she could intervene. And she did. She channeled to me from her okay. home in Chapel Hill. And so, in other words, when I was first waking up from coma. Right. I remember these six faces. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm mentioning and and I did, although I didn't know the name to attach to them in coma, right. as I'm waking up, I it's coming back to me the memory of who these people are. And I said, You were there, you, you and you. Well, where was Susan? Where's Susan? She was there too. And they told me, Well, she was never physically here. She channeled to you yes. uh, from Chapel Hill on nights four and five. And that was specific instructions. I knew the details of that communication. And to me, it made perfect sense. And of course, by that time, I realized that communication in that realm is not slave to distance and time. So, or exactly. distance. So, uh, made perfect sense that Susan was right there in my face, as were the other people. Uh, but getting to your your point, um, to me, an interesting thing is that these really were the other five faces who were physically there mm -hmm. were truly people who were only uh, present in the ICU room the last twenty four hours of coma. Uh, mm -hmm. And to me, there were other family and friends who were there earlier in the week who I didn't remember. And so the timing of their appearance was helpful at pegging the vast majority of the coma events, of the spiritual journey events, as mm -hmm. happened by the end of day four or day five, because that's when I saw Susan Wrenches. Um, so I, I do believe, I certainly appreciate the nature of your question, uh, but the faces that I remember, and they're burned into my mind, I can remember today visually exactly how they appeared to me at the end of coma. I mean, that's what I remember, is that visual appearance. Uh, and uh, it was so real. And it was as if they were th there physically, their physical selves, because I'm very Absolutely. familiar with the notion that we can interact with spirit bodies of our loved ones. For example, I tell the mm -hmm. story in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe, of when I first encountered my father's soul, uh, my adoptive father, because he was not there in my NDE. And if I had scripted it, he would have been there front and center. In fact, that was one of right. the deep mysteries to me when I did start reading the NDE literature after my coma uh, was that my father was not that spiritual guide. Instead, it was this beautiful woman on the butterfly wing who I felt I knew so deeply because we'd had this mind meld several times during the experience. 
And yet I didn't know who she was for my life. And then mm. when I started reading the NDE literature. I realized that was to me almost a game breaker. I realized that a very profound spiritual experience, but why these dirty tricks of the universe that my father wasn't there. And I had this woman right. who felt I knew so deeply and closely, and yet I'd never met her in my life. You know, those were for me, very deep challenges. And that's why four months post coma, when I received that picture in the mail, it's almost like she's looking at me as if to say, do you finally get it? <laughs> I have to say, yes, Betsy, I finally get it. Pretty uh, amazing, isn't it? It really is an astonishing, astonishing story. I mean, every time, oh, I, but I just get chills. Yeah, I, I love it because because I can see it, and I, you know, it's like, well, obviously, it's like since it's not imprinted in space and time, it's like it happened to you yesterday, and it's so right. real, and that, and that's what's really cool for the science side is like, how can something be so real that happened so long ago? So. Right. Where does memory exist? But well, before we get into the science of that, I just want to ask yeah. you one thing. The right. inky blackness, you talked about that. So right. can you go into that a little bit? Because wow, I talked that's about the core. The void. Now yeah. the core is beyond boundaries. The core yes. is where all is resolved. And I made several passes yes. into that core realm. Uh, the thing, I think the most important thing to say about it, it is the most a purely uh, at-home feeling I've ever had in my life. You talk about a spiritual home and feeling like exactly where you belong. That core realm was it. And of course, as I said, that's where I recognized that that uh, infinitely loving, unconditionally loving creative force of the God force, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that so many indie ears describe, Yes. Uh, and again, this is not whether you want to call it God or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit. It's simply acknowledging this incredible force of love at the core of the universe mm -hmm. that is there for all of us. That is the fundamental lesson of NDEs. And I call it a dazzling darkness. I often use that phrase to try and bring the paradox into <clears throat> a comfort zone uh, where people realize that this is... Um, all the things that we see that seem to be mm -hmm. separations that, you know, good, bad, dark, evil, ma male, female, et cetera, et cetera, all the opposites in this world come mm -hmm. to a resolution at that source of all that is. And it, it is uh, very apparent to you as you exist in that uh, uh, beautiful state of oneness with that, uh, with that core realm. Uh, yes. it, and, but and it's that love that, uh, uh, you know, as an indie ear is just so amazing. I used to think you could really bring it back here, but you certainly can invite people to share by exploring consciousness. And yes. I know Karen, for example, has never had an NDE, mm -hmm. and yet uh, she is deeply uh, personally knowing of that uh, loving force. I know from my relationship with her. Absolutely. That ink, it's interesting that, you know, because I, I talk about, you know, when you go into say, literally you obviously when, when I, when I scan you, um, like I do everybody, uh, Evan, you went further and you were more conscious than most end of years. So, which is, which is the difference, you know, you, me, Anita, Marjani, who cured herself of cancer and all that. Right. So you went further, but again, you were more conscious of what was happening to you, which is really, right. which is, which I'd like to study more uh, on how that works. Well, that's a beautiful observation, but I'll yeah. also point out that mm -hmm. my journey was clearly incomplete. The fact that that amnesia was there, because I'm certain if I were to go on and have a complete death experience, I would have moved beyond that amnesia into full recognition of who I was. Uh, yes. And yet I, I recognize, you know, in the months after my coma, why I couldn't follow a more traditional narrative, because I would have been mm -hmm. tempted to reject it. That's really kind of the bottom line is I needed this kind of shock and awe of, yeah. of my journey for me to accept it as, as real. That's, that's what, and, and one thing you find about NDEs is they're always tailored to the individual who's having them. That's the only important the thing filter. is the yeah. lessons that that individual can gain from them. And mm -hmm. I guess it just so happens that a neurosurgeon who has meningitis, uh, right. that's a severe case that it should have killed him and certainly wiped out his neocortex uh, in the process of trying to kill him, um, to then have a complete return of memories shows us a whole lot about consciousness and memory and how it's not based in the physical brain. And how you can heal. 
but and how you can that's that that's the <laughs> most important that you point out is the yes. healing that comes from it you're right but the inky blackness because when people when i say you go up into say the spirit realm and it's just literally a void you call it the inky blank blackness you know i call it the more dazzling darkness is a phrase it's dazzling darkness you. exactly and most people go well you know you're 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 seeing god however you define it and it's just like pure brilliance and so on but it's actually a like an inky void or a dazzling blackness because there's no time and space there so there can't be right. any light there right and i have well in you fact know? i had the entire what i perceived as the whole higher dimensional multiverse throughout all of eternity there is this complex oversphere for teaching yes. and that sh that should give you an idea of the vastness of the of the of the core realm uh, if the entire higher dimensional multiverse through all of eternity is just a small part of it that certainly gives you an idea of the power and the scale of, of this kind of realm to be uh, adventuring in. Absolutely. So talking about that inky blackness, uh, let's talk about some consciousness. So uh, again, you know, you read that consciousness is, lives inside the brain. I don't believe that. Uh, you know, you obviously that consciousness, I would think lives in that inky blackness and we're just like connecting to it at somehow. But what are your insights on what what consciousness is? Well, I'll tell you, it turns out I've had a great advantage. Uh, you know, many people often ask me, what do your skeptical scientific colleagues make of your story? And what I can tell you, is some of the greatest support I have had in this world in the last 15 years since my coma has been from the scientific and medical community. Oh, that's so a tremendous amount of support and, and specific sites I would recommend, scientificandmedical.net, galileocommission.org. Both of those websites, I serve as a scientific advisor for these groups. There are a lot of scientists involved in this work. And the scientific models are actually advancing rapidly to leave materialist nonsense in the rearview mirror. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we realize is that consciousness is fundamental. That, and in yeah. fact, it's united. We are sharing consciousness with all sentient beings throughout the cosmos and throughout all of eternity. And it's really the mind of the universe. This was a mind uh, that existed before the Big Bang, that was part mm. of, you know, the uh, emerging reality that was the Big Bang in this universe. Uh, and what we look at is the brain is a filter uh, right. that reduces that primordial mind down to these little eddy currents of consciousness that we kind of think are our own. You know, most of us run it through our life thinking that our thoughts are our own, our mentation is our own, only we can ex uh, uh, have our experiences. And yet there's tremendous evidence in the scientific world for telepathy, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read Guillaume Playfair's book on twin telepathy, you'll find 35% of identical twins have powerful telepathic experiences. And of course, it's not just, uh, you know, twins who have tele telepathy. The, the day I went into coma, I had not... Uh, uh, been with my birth mother, who I'd met a year earlier. I'd not been with her now for about three or four months. And she knew that morning, she was coming back from a business meeting. She knew something was dreadfully wrong. She called our family, mm. to find out what's going on, what's wrong with him. And then she was wow. told he went to coma this morning, meningitis on a ventilator, uh, not necessarily going to survive it. So that was a telepathic connection with my birth mother. But there are many such examples, and when you study them, you find that telepathy can be a very real uh, aspect of human experience. So we have overlap in our mentation. Then when you hear about uh, near-death experiences, like Anita Morjani is a perfect example. When mm -hmm. she was in the process of leaving her consciousness, leaving her body at the time of death, she was aware of her brother who was flying. He was alive and flying from... Uh, from India to Hong Kong, you know, hopefully to see her alive, but also presumably potentially for her funeral. Uh, mm -hmm. She was melded with his mind, knew exactly what he was going through on the airplane coming down, but mm -hmm. also melded with the mind of her father who had passed over. And he helped her come to a realization that the reason that she had gotten the, the lymphoma in the first place was because of her fear of cancer and informed her that if she chose to come back to this world, the cancer would disappear, which it did. So that's why I love the point that you make, emphasize it's really about the healing. And the more we all realize we're spiritual beings in a spiritual universe, we have a tremendous amount of will in the form of our higher soul that goes mm -hmm. far beyond the will of the ego. Uh, and this is where meditation and centering prayer can come in so handy. But uh, to me, it's been a, a, a beautiful gift as a healer, you know, as a neurosurgeon to mm -hmm. find 
how much power we all have to bring health, healing, and wholeness into mm -hmm. our lives. But it's by acknowledging the love, kindness, compassion, acceptance, mercy of the universe, of that God force for us, and to realize that the hardships and challenges in life in many ways are just gifts. And it's how we respond to those challenges. And the mm -hmm. more we can remain loving, kind, and compassionate for our fellow beings and for ourselves uh, through this whole process, uh, which is not, you know, an ego function, but it's really more of a, a kind of a higher soul choice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we start getting health and healing in our lives and more comfort. Uh, in fact, uh, I, just as I said, when I woke up from coma, as my sister Phyllis told me, I was sitting on the bed like a little Buddha looking at everyone in the eye. Now, I don't remember this, but I heard it from multiple witnesses. But very soon after I woke up, I would just sit there and look at them and say, don't worry, all is well. And then I <laughs> the next person, all is well. So in many oh, ways, beautiful. it's just a way of coming into your life, realizing that uh, all is well, that we are taken care of. If we uh, have this uh, uh, beautiful love and trust in the universe, that it tends to reward us uh, mm -hmm. with health and healing and wholeness. But our responsibility then is to show as much as we can, unconditional love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness for all of our fellow beings, beginning with ourselves. Because I realize that some of the worst problems in this world are that we don't love ourselves enough as the divine and sacred being. That is key. I think and we've we, forgotten like we who we are, you know, and, and, and you, you know, obviously is uh, what you said is really, really beautiful. But, uh, you know, to add to that, it's really key that we need to know that we are a grand version and the part that we're playing is just very minimal compared to who okay. we are. So all is well, guys. <laughs> okay. All <laughs> is that. well. Absolutely. Right. Um, I, I, um, talking about reincarnation, cause you brought, you just, you just did a little clip right. on reincarnation and you know, the, most of the, well, the three uh, Abrahamic religions, they don't believe in reincarnation. You know, some Eastern philosophies believe in reincarnation. So, talk about that, and you know, what 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 you think reincarnation is, and how you experienced it. Well, first of all, I need to point out uh, to people who grew up in a Christian faith, like I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, is that Jesus knew of reincarnation? Jesus spoke of John the Baptist as being a reincarnation of an earlier prophet. Mm -hmm. So that concept was right there, fact of life. Uh, yeah. Okay, but uh, uh, the powers that be that uh, determined centuries later what went into the Bible uh, made sure that uh, reincarnation was not part of it. And they, they were trying to codify Christianity, use it to control people, to tie the people. Uh, you know, they had very different purposes in mind than bringing the original message of Christ uh, mm -hmm. to bring peace and, and love and harmony to the world. So uh, just so, one second. So, wait a second. So, is this is your your explanation of say jesus was that part of your concept or belief before your near death or is it now no it, i i i really didn't know much about any of that before uh okay. anything that christ said but i would say since then i've come to recognize uh that that was you know, that, that thing that Christ said, I think the few other things that I, I would quote from the Bible, even though I have no idea where they are in the Bible, one is these things in greater ye shall do, implying, yeah. you know, here is the quote, son of God telling human beings that they could do greater things than him. That's an important statement, because what I believe Christ was telling us is we yes. are all divine, sacred children of God, uh, yes. period. Uh, he wasn't Absolutely. separating himself out. I, I would say he was the most ego-free person in history. Uh, and there's absolutely zero way he would have been claiming some special priority. He was very special in that he fully realized the kingdom of God lies within you, which is exactly the message that's coming in the modern world as we realize in studying the science of consciousness that consciousness is fundamental. It's primary in the universe, that all the physical emerges from consciousness. And Christ knew that 2,000 years ago. That's Absolutely. exactly what he was saying. These things greater you shall do also. Uh, in other words, this is a power we all have, uh, this eternal life. Uh, and that's what was being indicated. Now, let's get back to the question of reincarnation, because as a scientist, 
-hmm. when I came back from my NDE, reincarnation was clear as a bell to me that it had to be part of the overall equation. And yet mm -hmm. I didn't know there was a gigantic scientific basis to reincarnation. Turns out it, a lot of it was occurring 60 <laughs> miles away from where I live, University oh, wow. of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies. Ian Stevenson back in the 1960s started studying children with memories of past lives. And what they discovered to their surprise uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s was that a lot of these children had memories that they were talking about at ages two and a half or three, you know, when they first started talking, wow. that of names and of villages, of events, of modes of death, et cetera, that they then could find actually occurred with a living person. And in fact, today, if you review the database from the University of Virginia, go to uvadops.org, they have more than 3,700, or sorry, 2,700 cases of past life memories in children that they've investigated. And 1,700 of those cases are what they call solved. That is, they found the person who existed. And, you know, when you read that literature, you read it with an open mind and you realize these are discerning, skeptical scientists who mm -hmm. have carried out this research. You realize reincarnation is absolutely real, scientifically validated. Don't even pretend that it doesn't exist unless you want to confess that you're just ignorant of the data. OK, that's fine to be un, un, unknowledgeable about it, but don't right. claim to have an opinion about it unless you've studied the data. And the Absolutely. data is very clear that reincarnation is very real. And for, if you want just an incredibly powerful story along those Absolutely. lines, uh, I would recommend Soul Survivor, uh, S-O-U-L Survivor. It's by Bruce and Andrea Leininger. So. Uh, at any rate, getting back to the, the reincarnation, the, uh, mm -hmm. there are others, not just the UVA group, Jim Matlock, Carol Bowman, others who have studied these cases, and they're absolutely fascinating. And mm -hmm. we just have to open our minds to the scientific study of consciousness in all of its many forms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe. We bring up all of this information uh, and make a strong case for the primacy of mind through neuroscience, philosophy of mind, parapsychology, and all the evidence for non-local consciousness, mm -hmm. as well as quantum physics. Do not forget, quantum physics is one of the most powerful primary scientific indicators of the reality of consciousness and its fundamental Absolutely. nature of anything in this universe. Uh, yes. So it's very important to understand where uh, quantum physics is headed, especially important to note that in 2022, the Nobel Prize in physics was given for entanglement. And yes. entanglement, when the scientific community wakes up enough to realize what's going on, they're going to realize that is a demonstration of the mental layer of the universe and how yeah. all information uh, assimilation and integration occurs at a level of the mental, which is yeah. much more primary than this physical universe. And that's yeah. how we can know things at a distance. We can know mm -hmm. things across time. Uh, that's why these experiences of life reviews can be so complete relivings of life, not mm -hmm. just remembering. It's mm -hmm. because that spiritual uh, uh, realm of the universe has tremendous access to all of this information. And that's what we can uh, benefit from going into meditation and centering prayer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, quantum, qu quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Uh, absolutely. That's, uh, again, that's uh, a lot of my teachings. Uh, by the way, it's just logistical. It's, it's just straight out science. I call it the first principle. Right. Where at that level, it's it's there's no gray area it's more accurate and more precise and more scientific than anything that we have at this level which is right really, and this is uh, again this is where you know if you really want true healing you'd have to go to that higher level and heal you know whether it's a you know single individual or a family or the human species you know we'd have to go at that high level right. or raise that consciousness you know to to come into that understanding that we're more than just the physical being here, right. which is really important about becoming mindfulness and you know spiritual health. So if you want to talk about the importance of spiritual health. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that the, the model that is emerging now in the scientific world about the study of consciousness is truly one of one mind, that we are sharing one mind. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not some woo-woo uh, kind of nonsense thing. It actually makes the most sense. And then we, we look at the brain as a filter that allows in a little eddy current of that one mind to allow us to uh, be conscious, sentient beings. 
Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is we can uh, dive deep in meditation and centering prayer, explore that consciousness, push away the boundaries that our little ego mind uh, says are there, uh, start exploring out across the veil. And that's where we can start having experiences that show us about the connectedness of mind and also start gleaning experiences that show us about that binding force of love. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, that my partner, Karen Newell, uh, that co-authored that book, Living in a Mindful Universe, uh, we've been together for 11 years now, and a lot of our work is in meditation and sound enhanced meditation. She's never had a near-death experience, and yet mm -hmm. I'm convinced that she has been to the same territory I have in terms of understanding uh, and kind of grokking and bathing in that ocean of, of unconditional love, mm -hmm. uh, love of the creator for the creation is how I often put it. Um, but she's done that through meditation and through other kind of modalities. Uh, and, and this is kind of the important lesson is we can come to a deeper sense of our spiritual connection through acknowledging that love we share with each other, uh, right. love with the universe at large. And that's what starts to guide us towards that wholeness and healing that you're talking about. Yeah, well, it's, I, I kind of look at it as neural pathways. You know, if we're one mind, say you created a pathway to, uh, again, that, um, uh, what is it, that dark brilliance that you called it? Uh, uh, dazzling darkness. Uh, dazzling darkness. Well, uh, Karen can go, oh, you know, Evan went that way. It's like, I'll try that as well, you know, and it, and it creates, you know, uh, that connection, that deeper, stronger connection. And then somebody else can connect with that. Uh, right. Because we are, like you said, all one mind, which is which is yeah, the important thing is turning off the little voice in the head. So many people identify <laughs> with the voice in their head as if that is their identity, that is their consciousness, mm -hmm. and really couldn't be further uh, uh, further from the truth. You know, the voice right. in the head, uh, in many ways, uh, that's your ego mind, and right. it can often be your enemy in this stuff. For example, in addictions. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, addiction, alcoholism, addiction to drugs, addiction to work, addiction to sex, addiction to love, addiction yeah. to exercise. We can be addicted to many, many things that can start to unravel our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but addiction is, is an ego issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, you often find psychologists, psychiatrists will use uh, you know, a ritual sacrifice of the ego to allow it to be reborn in a mm -hmm. healthy form. Uh, that ego can be a real problem. And, and by putting the ego voice into timeout. Now, when I meditate, my Evan Alexander voice in my head can state a request, make an intention, but then I leave it behind. I don't you know, try and follow the breadcrumbs of the linguistic voice and, and those thoughts. I've learned how to silence all that and put it into timeout and then start exploring that much richer kind of higher soul conscious connection with primordial mind. Uh, and so really just by simply turning off that little voice in the head and learning to ride the tones of sacred acoustics and to focus mm -hmm. on breathing, uh, I can very quickly get outside of that notion of here now and sense of self uh, mm -hmm. into a much broader uh, kind of aspect of consciousness, much more associated with higher soul. And this is the kind of thing we try and teach in our, in our meditation play shops. Mm -hmm. okay. I do both in person and we've done on zoom and things like that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now, I talk, I talk about hard. it as, as, as spatial referencing, you know, uh -huh. um, you know, there's a lot of discord and in, in, in conflict in the world. Um, obviously my audience knows my point of view, but uh, uh, I, I bet they'd love to hear what you think, why there's so much discord in the world or hardships or especially if we have free will. I would say it's because what we're facing now is a paradigm shift. It's a reckoning. It's a, a course mm -hmm. correction of humanity. That's yeah. not just a course correction of covering, you know, 10 or 20 years of, of thought and thinking. It's covering mm -hmm. about 5,000 years of thought and thinking and human reflections and experiences and attempts to understand the nature of reality. Uh, it's kind of fascinating to me that as, as I dive deep into this uh, work with fellow scientists studying consciousness and the nature of reality, what I find is that we're converging on truths that have been apparent to those in spiritual uh, practices going back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Truths of oneness, of connection, of the mental as being all that is. Uh, and finally, the science is proving that that is indeed the case. Uh, you know, this emerging science of consciousness as we portray in Living in a Mindful Universe or has been presented in other books, uh, for example, in Larry Dossie's book, One Mind, in mm -hmm. Steve Taylor's book, uh, Spiritual Science. 
uh, Bernardo Castrop's a beautiful paper on uh, you know, the universe in consciousness that was in mm -hmm. 2018 Journal of Consciousness Studies. These are all scientific uh, elucidations of the oneness of mind and the shared mm -hmm. mind. And this is high time for that to happen. Now, what I will tell you is when you have a paradigm shift of this magnitude mm -hmm. that is occurring, the fundamentalists of all different flavors go running for cover. And that's why you sense all this craziness out in the world today. The fundamentalists right. who are feeling so threatened, uh, even at a subliminal level from this Absolutely. kind of advance in knowledge, of uh, recoil. And you see that as a big flurry of activity. But don't worry. Pay it no mind. All is well. Because the evidence all leads in one direction. It right. leads towards this notion of one mind, that we're all in this together. And this is where I like to take the lead of near-death experiences. Once you realize scientifically that they are very valid uh, presentations of our bigger relationship with the universe, I think the lessons they offer are very important. And the yeah. most critical lessons that we that bring back in the NDE community are lessons of love, harmony, compassion for all beings, not exclusive. This is not just about human consciousness, uh, but it certainly involves all of humanity. And for us Absolutely. to pretend that we're separate and that we're at odds with each other, that we're in competition with each other, that there are limited resources, in many ways is missing the deep spiritual message of oneness, of connection, that there is enough, that we can take care of each other, that we don't continue to strip resources from this planet as if they are infinite, but we need to respect uh, the limitations of nature and acknowledge the power of, of spirit and unification through our spiritual identity and investigations to yeah. allow us to grow into uh, true homo sapiens. I mean, sapiens means wise. I would say to date, uh, when I look for wisdom in human uh, endeavors, I find, yes, there's some wisdom in, say, medical advances, communications, transportation. Mm -hmm. When I look at the big picture, <clears throat> And I look at our addiction to fossil fuels and the corporate greed that has led to carbon yeah. dioxide buildup in our atmosphere uh, and, <laughs> and all the other problems of that false sense of separation where greed uh, is leading people yeah. to uh, you know, limit other people's resources. And the, and the way it influences, for example, how we treat refugees. Mm. Uh, the whole world should be opening up to people displaced from their homes by warfare Absolutely. and violence. Uh, you know, it's, it's just who we are as humans. Uh, and yet you see this recoil against, uh, against people in the yeah. modern so I would say this awakening and the lessons coming from NDEs of love, compassion, kindness, mercy, mm -hmm. of living together, bringing harmony to this world are just in the nick of time. And they're coming because we are have been kind of improper stewards of this planet. Mm -hmm. You know, one species is threatening a million plus species with extinction. Well, guess what, people? It's time to wake up, take proper stewardship for this planet and uh, start living uh, as the spiritual beings we are in a spiritual universe, acknowledging this oneness and this binding force of love and how we really all need to uh, uh, kind of wake up to this deep truth. And it's very liberating and refreshing, not only for humanity at large, for, but for the individual seeker. Yeah. And that's where the real reward comes in. I, I, I started the Save the Human Project, because mm -hmm. uh, if we save ourselves and really get smart on what we're really supposed to be doing. Everything else is going to be all well. <laughs> the earth comes back to its natural, you know, natural state of, uh, you know, natural state of balance. Cause that's what this universe is really about a natural oh, state of balance. And we're really off kilter. I'd love to talk to you more. Um, Pepe, do you have any questions that, Oh, he's, she's got some personal questions for you. Well, good, but I'll tell you what I recommend. I recommend we have another conversation. I, I would love to. I would love to bring Karen into it, Karen Newell. She's oh, brilliant source of wisdom. She's been a spiritual mentor, and mm -hmm. I think that would be great. And uh, certainly, it sounds like your wife uh, has uh, a I lot think, to contribute to this discussion, too. So, Absolutely, yeah. We could You could bring Karen. I'll bring uh, Faith. Uh, yeah. And I think that'd be a fantastic uh, fantastic conversation. I would love that. I would love yeah. it. Well, Elizabeth, be certainly set it up if you get in touch with her. Absolutely. So as we end, uh, mm -hmm. is there any one thing right now that you could give people, I don't want to call it hope 
because hope is like the last ditch effort, but something that, you know, brings people back into their memory of how grand they really are. Well, I would say no soul left behind. This mm. is a revolution for all of us. Uh, and if you've ever felt like you were alive and you were seeking a purpose, uh, trying to find meaning, I can tell you the meaning is there. You can discover it. Going within, you know, set aside 20 minutes a day for meditation. If you need a tool to help you go deep, use a binaural beat brainwave entrainment in the form of sacred acoustics. There's a free 20 minute OM download at uh, sacredacoustics.com. You can get started with that. And Karen also has some beautiful free teaching videos on her website, sacredacoustics.com. Uh, join the revolution. Uh, it is something that leads to healing, not only for the world at large, for, but for each and every individual soul partaking in it. So consider this an open invitation uh, and never forget that all is well. Evan, thank you so much. This has been Evan Alexander. I'm Moss Sajati. Uh, thanks for listening to XI, Exponential Intelligence. Well, Moss, thanks so much for having me on. Great talking with you. We'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take Thank care. you, Moss. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.